Um, that song, well, all those songs, Lord, but um, yeah, your, your faithfulness, Lord, yesterday, today, and always, in spite of our failures, in spite of our weaknesses, in spite of all of the stuff that we are that are, is completely opposite of who you are, you remain who you are, and uh, uh, that will never change. Your love, your grace, your mercy um, is, has always been and will always be consistent, and Lord, we, I don't know how we can thank you enough for that. Um, and that's what the world, that's what the enemy is trying to keep hidden. And so as we study things like we're studying the, the conflict that exists, not just within your people of this world, but Lord, in, within the spiritual realm, um, it's, a, it's a tough pill for us to swallow. It's, it's not comfortable, but, but the scripture throughout is, is, has, has told us and warned us. And so at some point, Lord, we're going to have to figure this out and see it for what it is. And so God, open our eyes here tonight to, to see what it is that you want us to see about the real conflict, conflict that happened at the cross, which Psalms tells us about, but we don't even understand about the, the spiritual forces that were there that day at the cross. So um, it's a very real thing, and we need to start paying attention. So be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, one last thing. just I, I'm, I'm not sure if, uh, if many of you guys know, but one of the, uh, you know, there's, there's several different, I don't know, I guess, guys that I like to, to read about and read from and learn from and that have an impact. Now, I, you know, I've, I've learned over the years to not just go by everything they say because I do my own study. Uh, but but people that I really respect, um, and one of the guys that actually really was was instrumental from not just me but for thousands of people like me um, for getting us to start looking at what we're talking about this this unseen realm um, was uh, it was the author that he, in fact he put out that uh, a book like that. If you don't have that, I would highly recommend that you get it. It's it's absolutely stunning, um, and uh, his name is Dr. Michael Heiser. And he's really, really good, he's a great teacher, um, kind of a fun guy, uh, real laid back. He's not, uh, there's, you know, there's, you're not gonna watch him because he's exciting to watch, that's for sure. But uh, he's a great teacher. Um, and we just got word and, you know, you wondered if you followed him and I don't follow him like, like all the time, but there are certain things that I'll go and chase him down and see what he has to say about it. Like Arnold Fruchtenbaum, I do that with too. Um, but uh, he's been battling with cancer for the last year, and uh, it just got to the point where there's nothing else they can do for him. And so he put out a letter, and uh, uh, <clears throat> you'll start seeing stuff around um, that uh, they're gonna, you know, they wanna concentrate. He says, you know, he said, time is not in our hands, it's in God's hands. And he goes, they're expecting to have a week uh, with him, him and his family, or, you know, maybe a few weeks at best. And so, um, so if you didn't know about that, you do now. And so just pray for him and for his ministry. It's an, it was an incredible ministry. I don't want to say it was. It is an incredible ministry. And the, the impact that he has had on the, on the body of Christ is, is, is pretty, pretty staggering. Because I really feel like God used him to sort of snap us out of our lethargy. Um, <coughs> excuse me, because he, um, you know, he just, he, he's looking at these things from the perspective. I always wondered about, many of us did. We read these passages and look at them and go, well, you know, man, I... How come nobody's talking about this? And they didn't until he shows up and, and, and a few guys like him. And then all of a sudden you're starting to go, oh, and now it's starting to make sense. So anyway, so uh, if, if you know anything about Dr. Heiser, he's, uh, um, you know, so just, you know, continue to pray for them because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty rough. But, um, you know, he's blessed. He's not afraid. Obviously he knows where he's going, right? So, but, uh, so much of what we're talking about here is actually stuff that I've sort of picked, picked through as, as I've, as I've studied his work and, uh, uh, and and seeing some of the the perspectives that he brings, and uh, and so that's kind of where where all of this originated. So, so we've been looking at um, this idea of Jesus as the Spirit of prophecy. So remember that the Spirit is the idea of ruach, which is bread, uh, breath. I'm sorry. So it's um, origin, or you know, or uh, uh, you know, it's life. So and then of course prophecy. I'm not clicking. Um, Prophecy is the idea, again, member of proclamation, of, of proclaiming. So, so the origin of proclamation of truth, because that's, of course, who Jesus is, is Jesus. So, um, so we've been looking at that, and uh, we've, we've, we spent time, we looked at the fall, we looked at the results of that, um, and we'll, we'll conclude here this evening, or at least I hope. Let's see what we got here. Nope. So um, in Genesis, uh, and then we, uh, we'll get to... Uh, uh, we'll get into Genesis 6 here 
um, coming up. Because in, in Genesis chapter 3 with the fall, we saw this idea of, uh, uh, of the, the two types of evil. There's, there's the one evil that rejects God's word, sort of rebels against truth, right? Rejects them. And then there's, there's the other type, which we've been talking about and we'll hopefully conclude with tonight, um, which is the idea of, of not just rejecting him um, and his truth, but replacing him uh, with creation. So, you know, beginning the worship or the perversion of worship to worship the creature, which is what Paul tells us in Romans chapter one, rather than the creator. That's an entirely different mindset uh, flow than what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden with the serpent, okay? So uh, once we get the slides clicking here, so I'm just gonna continue to move so we'll, you'll pick a lot of this up. So as we moved through all of this, we saw that because of the, the deception and the, the, the selfishness of, of Adam and Eve and uh, you know, the serpents you know, lying about what God said, that this caused them, as God had warned it it would, it caused them to separate themselves from God. This, this idea of you shall die, you shall surely die, um, is the idea of, uh, you know, of separation. And that's exactly what happened. And, and we talked about the whole blame game there, that when this happens, you know, it didn't take God by surprise. He wasn't shocked, you know, and wondering now what he was going to do. Uh, you know, he's, he's kind of on top of all of that stuff because, you know, he is God. And so, so he, you know, this is what he was doing. And, uh, but he had told them, look, if you do this, this is what's going to take place. You know, it's going to remove you from my presence. Um, and so that's exactly what happened. And because they were removed from God's presence and that's this place that God had prepared for them, then what ended up happening is that they now were outside of God. And as I talked about Sunday, which we're, it just so happens that's where we are in Daniel. Again, I, I, trust me, I'm not doing the Sundays and the Wednesdays to try to put together because I'm some sort of brilliant guy. It's just the way it's working out. It's pretty amazing, actually. But that, that, that when Adam and Eve did that, because Adam was given dominion over the earth by, by embracing the lie of the, of the serpent, nothing yet, uh, by embracing the serpent, uh, the lie of the serpent, then what they ended up doing was basically giving him dominion over the earth, which is exactly what Jesus said. You know, he's, and he's the God of this age. That's, we, we did that, not God, um, because we, in essence, handed over the keys to the kingdom. And so that's, you know, and, and the results of that are what we see in our world today. We see this, this fallen world. We see this world that because it rejects God's word, right, the word of the creator, that the result of that is death, deformity, disease, decay, all of the bad stuff that goes along with it. Um, yeah, I'm still not clicking. So, <clears throat> so, um, so we, uh, you know, so we, we're seeing that. Are we got a different one here? Yeah, I'm not sure what's happening because it's... This one seems it, to be working. Yeah, it's not... It's, no, it's the bottom, yeah. That's the one I've been pushing. It's working. Yeah, I'd rather not use that one. See, it's not working. Whoop, there it goes. Well, yeah, but it's, see, look, it's not working. I know, but I'm trying to go backwards. I have to go up to go backwards. <laughs> yeah. Technology, huh? Isn't it a wonderful thing? Can you close it and open it again? Yeah. So anyway, going back to what we were talking about. So this, this is what has created the problem in our world. So this is, you know, by, by giving him control, the enemy that is, then what ends up happening is he becomes just what Jesus said. He becomes the God of this age. Um, but there's another type of evil that is sort of parallel to that because both of these are opposed to God. Remember the saying, uh, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Um, so these two, these two sort of tracks of evil that we find in the scripture, um, uh, you know, come from both in the sense of one rejecting the, the word of God and one replacing him as the creator. And we see that with the sons of God. That's what we get to when we get to chapter six, that this idea that there was this, this uh, uh, group of supernatural beings, right? Now, we don't have time to develop the whole thing, but, but remember that as God gave man, uh, which one am I using? Is this one correct, up and down, or is it backwards like that one? Just the same? 
Yeah, there we go. Good. Okay, so now I'm going to go back. Okay, so um, so what ended up happening was that uh, uh, God has designed for the earth. Remember, God created the heavens and the earth. So God is beyond the heavens and the earth because we have this tendency to say there's heaven and therefore God is a you know is a part of that. No, heaven was a creation. Okay. So for it to be created in what we would call the supernatural realm, God obviously has to be outside of that. Hello? Or he can't create them. But within both the heavenly realm and the, and the earthly realm, sort of have dominion and authority. And in the supernatural or in the heavenly realm, that, of course, is the angels. That's where the angels come in. And God works through this, this a group of angels as it relates to the earth later on, but he works through these and they become what's called the divine council, okay, throughout the scripture. We see many occurrences of God talking with the divine council and making decisions. In other words, when he said, let us make man, he's not telling them that they're going to be a part of it, but they get to watch him, right? Job tells us that they were freaking out and, and, and rejoicing as he creates the heavens and or the, the earth and the cosmos, right? So, so what God does is, is he works through this council. Um, we saw this in, in, the, in our study in the book of Daniel with uh, what was going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar, that the message was delivered by one of these, these, the group of this God's heavenly council that were called the watchers. And, and they're the ones that God allows them, right? He gives them the right to determine how the relationship with what's happening on earth is going to go. And so it has been determined, right, by the watchers. It literally says that. And this is where Nebuchadnezzar, because you thought you were more than you are, you're going to be an animal for seven years, right? That's by the decree of the watchers. Now, they can make no decree if the true God doesn't allow them to do that. So this isn't, they're not, God is just allowing them to do the same thing that he allowed Adam to do until he gave it away in the garden. We see this again with um, with uh, King Ahab, and uh, and and well, I mean, there's there's so many different examples of this in the scripture, but nobody talks about this because we're not about the Old Testament. We're all New Testament, right? We live in New Testament times. Well, we do, but we should learn from the old. And so, all of these decisions are made in the heavenly council. That doesn't remove God. He's God. He's sovereign. He's above all, right? That's why he's called El Leon. He is God Most High. Okay. There are little G gods, that's what they would call themselves, we wouldn't call them that, but that's what they end up doing. So there's this, there's this hierarchy. This is exactly what Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 6, the spiritual powers and the authorities, right? That, so there's this rank and file. We met one of those, and we're going to talk about him more Sunday morning, um, one of those that's in a particular group of these angelic uh, um, beings um, in the heavenly realms, and his name was Michael. And Michael is the commander of the Lord's army. He says that, okay? We're not making that up. So there's this, there's this, you know, there's this divine council. I'm sure Michael is a part of that, but Michael leads the, the host of the Lord. Michael's fighting with uh, Lucifer over the body of Moses. Michael's fighting with Lucifer. We see it in, in the book of Revelation. It makes you wonder who, who uh, when Joshua crossed into the promised land, remember, and he came upon the figure and he said, you know, he went to draw his sword or, you know, are you for us or against us? And what did the, this rider on the horse say? No, I'm the, the captain of the host of the Lord. So, and then we read, of course, and this is why we're not sure that it's Michael. It may not be because Joshua bows. But is that the bow in the sense of worship, or is that bow in under, understanding the, you know, the, the, the structure of rank? We just don't know. But the point is that, so we, we meet a character like him, but then there's this divine council, and then there are, there's another group that are called the seraphs, or if in the plural, seraphim. They're the burning ones. Seraph, Hebrew seraph, which is where we get seraphim comes from, it means the burning ones. So they're, they're bright, they're illuminated. That's another category. Then you've got the cherubim, right? The cherubs. We say ch, but it's not. It's ch. It's the Hebrew um, furball word. Um, so, and because cherub is a sword. That's how you say sword in, in Hebrew. So these guys wield the swords. So it's the cherubim that God put outside the garden to keep Adam and Eve from getting back in. But apparently they also surround the, uh, the throne of God. 
because Ezekiel sees them. He's, and they're sometimes entitled or, or, or described as um, living creatures. So we could go on and on, but you get the idea. My, the point I'm trying to drive home is there's a supernatural and there's a natural. Well, when you come to Genesis chapter 6, there are 200 of them, um, wa- of the watchers, and their job is to watch. That's what they do, okay? And they're to, to, to pay attention to what's going on. Well, they decided that they were going to stop um, the seed of the woman, and they, they come, you know, you know, co, uh, coexisted with the women of the earth. And of course, this is the sons of God. They're also called the sons of God. And this is where you get this whole thing come in. But we know that they were judged, okay? So, and here's where we see where they were judged. Peter talks about this. So this is New Testament. And so in 2 Peter chapter 2, this is, Peter is talking about this particular group because in the whole context here is the flood, okay? So you can't, you can't ignore that. So anyway, so for God did not spare the angels who sinned, but he thrust them down into Tartarus, okay? So these angels that sinned, these are not fallen angels. We're going to get to those guys here in a minute. This is the watchers of Genesis chapter 6, also called the sons of God, okay? Because of what they did, they have been locked away, see? So this tells us that this is a completely different group than what we would call Lucifer is from. How do we know that? He's not there. <laughs> He's still free to roam. So I'm sure he, you know, played a part in this. But, but anyway, but this particular group of, of, of uh, angel, angelic beings, supernatural beings, because of what they did, they're locked away. Okay? And that's what Peter is talking about. And again, we don't live in first century Israel, you know, or even second century uh, or, you know, or going back to the second temple period. We don't, we don't know that. But if you lived in those days, there was never a question about what this was talking about, okay? It's only because we in the West have tried to look at it from our Western perspective and try to understand it that we have created more confusion than anything else. But if you lived in those days, you knew precisely who Peter's talking about. He's talking about Genesis chapter 6, the watchers, the sons of God, okay? That's who he's talking about. There's no question. For God did not spare the angels who sinned, but thrust them down in Tartarus, Tartarus, sorry, um, and delivered them into chains of darkness, and they're there until the judgment. What judgment? The one in Revelation. Okay? So these guys are held in this place because they did something that obviously very much upset God. All right? Well, what is that that they did? Well, we find that out from the book of Jude. Whoops, not clicking again. Still not clicking. Can you guys click for me back there? So we don't have to keep doing this? Okay, we got to get this fixed. Yep, anyway. Well, then Jude talks about the same aspect. And he says that this particular group of, of individuals, these angels, right, that they, in some of our translations, it says they left their first estate, Right? In other words, they abandoned the realm for which they had been created. Well, how did they abandon it? Because they, they came down into the physical realm. And, and like Peter says, these guys were also judged. Okay? He says the same thing. So this, it's not like we're looking at something Old Testament here that changed with the coming of the Holy Spirit and, and the age of grace from the age of law. That's just absolute nonsense. But that's what we're taught. But yet the scripture is consistent all the way through with this, old to new. From Genesis 6, we find the final demise of these guys in Revelation, the, first, the last book. So we see it in the first book and the last book. So, I mean, it's just, it's just incredible. But it's when we understand what's taking place here that it sort of becomes, all of a sudden, all these weird places that we read in the New Testament um, and I'm not gonna, probably not going to see it, but Paul, and I can't remember the reference, but Paul identifies this in, in his letter to the church at Corinth. And he says to them, look, the women need to keep their heads covered. Does anybody know what the rest of that verse says? Why? Because of the angels. Oh, and we read that and we go, well, what the heck does that mean? Or, well, that angels means messengers, so the women have to keep their heads covered because of, what? That doesn't even make sense. 
But if you're Paul talking to a first century group of people that understand this stuff, they know precisely what you're talking about. That the covering for the woman was to protect them. It was a, it was a means of protection because, because there was this supernatural interference. And this is why the husband is over there. He's the protector, which is what Adam failed to do in the garden. So we could, you know, we could go on and on. You get the idea. But, uh, okay, whoops, we were, we were just there. Let's try that. Let me see if I got this down. And here's that Jude passage. And those angels having not kept their first place, in other words, they, they didn't stay within the realm that they were created to, okay, or created to be in, but having des deserted their dwelling place, he has kept in everlasting chains of darkness, under darkness, for the judgment of the great day. Jeez, he sounds like he's talking to Peter. Well, that's because they both are. The, the New Testament writers had no problem identifying what we're talking about in Genesis 6, but modern theology doesn't want to talk about it. It's pathetic. It's, it's in, it, it, we should be embarrassed by this because we could just go on and on. Now, when we talk Sunday, we're going we're gonna to see this whole idea in Genesis, or in Genesis, Daniel chapter 10 with this whole idea of the ancient of days, and then Gabriel speaking to, which is where we left off last Sunday, where Gabriel is the, an angel, by the way, is speaking to a physical man within the realm of mankind called Persia, an empire. And he's telling them, Daniel that, look, I would have been here earlier, but the, the, the being that controls these guys or is in control of this, he wouldn't let me through until Michael came. Remember, we talked about this. So, and again, that's exactly what Paul tells us in the New Testament. How we break these things apart is beyond comprehension, but we do. So these guys, they did something that they never should have done, okay? They abandoned the realm or the, the way that God had created them and, and, and tried to, uh, attempted to mingle the supernatural with the natural to pollute the bloodline so that the seed of the woman, Jesus, could not be born. And of course, we know what happened, okay? The result of that, of that attempt, these guys that get this judgment, they were judged because they did this. Um, and the, what, what ended up happening was, we call them, of course, again, the sons of God and the daughters of women, the watchers and the women, and the supernatural, the natural realms is what we're talking about. Now, what's interesting about this, and again, I, 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 you know, I know I've said this before, but you got to understand this. Every culture, and I'm talking every culture for as far back as you want to go in human history, every single one of them identified that there was a commingling of supernatural with the natural realm. In other words, divine beings that came in. Every single one. The one we're most familiar with is, of course, Greek mythology. And this is why I use it so much because it because this you know these people just didn't come up with this all you know on their own. Remember these were these were people that were separated by you know there was no communication in those days. And what there was you know I mean it would take months or years to get so so there, it wasn't like these people were all sitting around coming up with the same ideas. But they all had the same understanding. And so the Greeks, and so these, this, this commingling of the supernatural with the natural produces what became known as the Titans, the Latin word titanes, which is a demigod, half human, half God, Hercules, Achilles. You get the idea. I know we've talked about this a hundred times, but we have to get this. Every culture, you can go back as far as you want to the Sumerians, okay? They all understand this. With that era, do I mean we could just go on and on, and but but you need to understand that we're the ones that have messed this up, okay? And that's why there's such a problem and such confusion in the church today over this. There are people that will leave church over these over these issues. How do I know? They've left this church. I can't help it. This is the truth. You know, it, it is what it is. It may it makes you uncomfortable. You just well, I just can't believe that. Well, that's too stinking bad. That's what it says. You're going to have to deal with it. It's not, I didn't say it, you know? And again, even, even the early church fathers, Irenaeus, Origen, Tertullian, uh, oh gosh, uh, uh, the, all these other guys, every single one of them said that this happened. So why do we ignore these guys? 
Um, Josephus, a historian, for goodness sake, even said this happened. But no, 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 I don't want to hear that, you know. It's just, it's just sad. It is so sad how we have butchered the truth of God's word because it makes us uncomfortable. And I, like, I, you know, again, like I've said before, we have no problem in understanding a virgin birth, which is a what? A commingling of the literal divine with the natural, right? The virgin birth. What is that? The incarnation. That's the birth of Jesus Christ. Well, we can accept that one. And knowing full well that the scripture constantly teaches that the enemy is, is perverting what God does, the truth that God does in, into a lie, but, we're, we're, but, but he, he, he won't do that. Well, wh why would you think that he wouldn't? And, if, and then if not, then define for me who the, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are in the book of Revelation. I mean, I mean you, you can't have it both ways, man. So anyway, so these, these, this, the, the combination, the offspring... Of these two, of course, we've talked about this, and they were called the Nephilim. Singular, Nephal. Nephal literally means to fall. That's what it means. So when it's, the im is put on the end, it's a Nephilim, so it then becomes the fallen ones. There's a group, okay? So they're the offspring of this union, okay? Now, we know... Uh, the Bible doesn't address it, but in other what we call pseudopagraphical writings, Enoch, Jubilees, blah, 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 all of these others, and there's many, many others, that they clearly understood what this meant, okay? And that those, the, the offspring, the fallen ones, the, the, the offspring of the daughters of men and the sons of God, that they were the reason of the flood. That's why the flood happened. When we read in Genesis 6 that God saw that the, 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 every thought of man's heart was, in, was intent only on evil all the time. But we learned from those other books what that was. They were tampering with, quote unquote, the gene pool. And you say, well, how would they know to do that um, in, in the days of Noah? Uh, there were supernatural beings involved. In fact, those books, Enoch and those other books, tell us that that's one of the things that the watchers did is they brought knowledge to man that man was not supposed to have at that point. So, you know, but anyway, so the God sends the flood on all flesh. Why? Because they had even messed the gene pool in, within animals. And, and has, this, has anything ever changed? No. We still see this happening. There's still and there has been... Uh, good grief forever, the idea that man knows about the, the genes in, within man, and that if you can manipulate those, you can make, you know, you can, you can do weird things. I mean, they were trying to do this back in the days of the Nazi. Ever see the movie, The Boys from Brazil? What was that all about? They're trying to clone Hitler in the 30s. So, I mean, again, but we don't, we don't want to talk about that. So this is, where, where, does, where does this information in the 30s come from? Well, science was just, well, yeah, no, where, where did those guys learn from? You see, it's just been passed on. So they brought this, the watchers brought more than this commingling. What they brought was, was, was knowledge that wasn't supposed to be known, at least under those circumstances. So God sends the flood. He destroys the Nephilim physically, okay? But like all created things, there's a, there's a uh, uh, you know, beyond the physical side, right? So though they're physically destroyed in the flood, they are, um, and because they are not fully supernatural or fully natural, in other words, they're not from heaven or from earth, their spirits are condemned to roam between heaven and earth, and their hunger and thirst are never satisfied. God tells them, this is in the book of Enoch, again, I get it, it's not the Bible, Take it or leave it. I don't really care one way or another, but it sure explains a lot about the rest of the scripture that they're always looking for something. They're always hungry. They're always thirsty, but they cannot quench it. The book of Enoch tells you why. Okay? So, so they're, they're stuck. They're neither from heaven with the angels and they're neither from the earth with the women. So they're stuck in the realm between these are the ones that I've said repeatedly that Jesus encountered. This is who was, was behind the, the demoniac at Gadara, right? We are legion, right? And one individual. And so, um, and so, and of course, and again, 
Jesus was going to move them out, but they, 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 want, they want something to touch with reality. So they said, let us go to the pigs, right? He has no problem with that, go, right? So, so, and then he even talks about this when an unclean spirit is, is moved out of a house. Remember, what does it do? Remember what Jesus taught us? It goes around and it finds others that are more wicked than itself. And then it comes back to the house that it left and it looks like it's all cleaned up there. Hey, boys, let's move back in, right? Who's he talking about? These guys. He called them evil spirit, wicked spirits, a demon. That's what they end up becoming, um, becoming uh, known as, okay? Whoops. So, so notice that they're, they're, you know, that this is very different because Jesus would encounter these guys, but he would also encounter Lucifer, what we would call Lucifer, right? But there's completely different in the way that he would deal with that in contrast to, to these. There, there's a complete difference because Lucifer is not one of these, okay? So if you saw the movie The Exorcist, what I did when it came out when I was a kid in high school, didn't sleep for a month after I saw it, but, um, but that's, that's what you're talking about. You see, you think it's the devil. It's not the devil. It's these guys. They're the ones that seek possession because they, they want something tangible that they can at least work through, right? That's what they're doing, okay? And then we're going to see that there's a whole other group. They're called fallen angels, and we're going to see where they're coming from if I don't run myself out of time. Now, so we notice that this, is, uh, this, uh, this here is explaining um, what, they, you know, what these guys were, so we're going back a little bit. But notice that last phrase. And also, or what, there were giants in the earth in those days. That was before the flood. And then what's the last phrase? And after that, oh. So whatever these guys were and the influence that they had made it past the flood. Well, how do we know? Because the, the, the descendants of the Nephilim or people in that line, which we're going to see here in just a minute, um, you know, where did they come from if the flood ended them? Well, here's, this is what most people believe. Guys, this thing is just, it's driving me crazy the way this clicks. So, so their physical line is carried on after the flood, and this is what we believe. Nobody knows this, okay? I'm telling you, it's being recorded. Don't go tell somebody Rick said, okay? I'm telling you, this is a logical and, in my opinion, probable way for this to happen. The physical line is carried on after the flood, most likely through Ham's wife, okay? One of the sons of Noah. The reason that people believe that is because in another book like Enoch, that is not scripture, but is referred to in scripture, is the book of Jasher. It's actually Yasher, but we call it Jasher. And in that, we learned that when, when, when Noah, with his three sons, were building the ark, that when it came time for the flood to come, his sons would have been young, that they were to go and they chose wives that where, where Moses, where Moses, where Noah was pure, right? We read that, uh, uh, that, that Noah found grace, found favor in the eyes. In other words, what it means is his gene pool wasn't polluted. I'm, I'm telling you, that's what the Hebrew word means. He was uncontaminated, okay? And, and therefore his sons would be. But their wives, that was a different story. So the book of Jasher sort of portrays it that that their wives, when they were brought on, were carrying this, this particular gene on with them. Now, that makes a lot of sense. Again, am I saying this is it? I don't know, and neither does anyone else. But this makes a lot of sense. Who is it that after the flood and they settle down, who is it that does something that is not natural to do with his father? Actually, his, the wife, his mother, is what he's doing. Ham. So there's something about Ham that is bent on going in the opposite direction, okay, like the sons of God, that's going in a different direction. And that's why most people, and again, this makes us uncomfortable, that what, what ultimately what's happening there is it's like, and we read this, in, uh, and um, Ham uncovered Noah's nakedness, okay? All right, and so why is that condemned? Ever been to a gym? Especially the guy's gym? Does that matter? 
So clearly something else is going on here. And what you come to, what you come to understand is that Ham molested his mother. That's what it means. Because she, uh, Noah was the covering for his mother, but he was drunk and he couldn't stop it. So Ham molests his mother. The, the child that is born is called Canaan, Canaan, right? Who does Noah curse? Ham? No, he curses Canaan. Well, what's he doing there? He's cursing because Canaan is something that's unnatural. Again, tampering with the gene pool. So the, 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 the idea is, some of the sages believe this and other people, that this is what happened. That Ham's wife, Mrs. Ham, that she would have brought some of this in. And, and according, I think it's the book of Enoch, as a matter of fact, says that she carried with her some of the writings from the Nephilim brought it on board, and this is what Ham did, and this is why he was, you know, the way he, he was so different than Shem and Japheth. Anyway, take it or leave it. We don't know that, but somehow this, this came to be. That makes logical sense. Does that mean it's the truth? No, but it sure makes sense. So the physical line is carried on after the flood, most likely through Ham's wife, okay? And then all of Ham's descendants, not all, most of Ham's descendants become people that are not just enemies of God, that are, but are unnatural, okay? One of the early ones in the line of Ham is named Arba, okay? And his name means the strength of Baal, a false god, okay? Now, Arba... There's a city actually named after him, um, which was called Kiriath, right? That's, that means the city of Ar Kiriath Arba. And if that sounds familiar to you, it should, because in Joshua chapter 14, after Joshua is going into the land, him and Caleb, and remember Joshua and Caleb were the two that, that said, look, we can go in here and take this place. Take it from who? The Canaanites, right? Who we look like grasshoppers to them. Right? They just, you know, God had just showed them that the, the, mat, the uh, uh, army of Egypt was nothing. But here they are, they're panicking over what's over there because they're sons of Anak, who was a son of Arba. So anyway, after they're conquered, Caleb, in his old years, and you can read it right there in Joshua chapter 14, verse 15, he comes to Joshua and he says, look, I've fought all these times faithfully. I served Moses. And you know, it was just you and I that stayed true to God when we were going to go into the promised land, he said, give me this land. This is the land that I would want. Where does he want? The land of Kiriath Arba, the land of Arba. It's really interesting. Caleb wants to homestead in literally in the backyard of the enemy. I mean, this is incredible. And he tells Joshua, I know they're still here, but don't worry about it. I'm going to get rid of them. This is the cop. This is why I've said a hundred times, Caleb is one of those guys. I can't wait to meet Caleb. This guy was so stunning. And we know so little about him. But he's asking for that place. Does anybody know what that place, Kiriath Arva, after Caleb takes it, what the name is changed? Does anybody know what the modern name, or actually throughout history, but now up to modern days, what the name of that place is? Hebron. Hebron. It's still there today. Did you know that? That Hebron, the city of Hebron, or he, it's actually pronounced Hebron, but that that's the place that Caleb said that, I want that, because right there is where the sons of uh, Arba are at, and that's his city, and I'm going to take it from him. Gosh, that sounds like right in the middle of, you know, Gaza? You, you see, you think it's a Palestinian and Israeli thing. I've told you a thousand times, it's not. This goes way beyond that. Okay, so his, one of his descendants was called Anak. Okay, now Anak means long-necked, but also giant. So again, something abnormal, something is wrong with these people. Okay, and his descendants become known as the Anakim, right? So, so the, the spirits of the, of the Nephilim and probably the bloodline through, uh, through Mrs. Ham is where we find these guys. And then, as, as, uh, as before they get to the promised land, 
under the leadership of Moses, Moses, as they're moving that direction, they run into two kings who were kings of this group of people called the Amorites, right? Bad, bad people, horrible people. And God, in fact, tells Abraham, 400 years from now, your, your uh, ancestors are going to come back from a, a different country. We know that's Egypt, right? Under what we call the Exodus. And God says, because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So whoever the Amorites are, God has clearly said there's a time when their evil and wickedness will reach its peak, and then I'm going to send you in there. Well, now we're in the days of Moses and Joshua and Caleb, and that's where the, what they're doing. They're going back in. I find it fascinating that whenever we talk about these, these, these abnormal whether it's in the supernatural or the, or the natural realm, in other words, the heavens or in the earth, that when God says he's going to take it back, that he sends his people to do it. And we know Gabriel's involved and Michael. We see that in the book of Daniel, right? And later, later on, we're going to see that it's actually the Jews. But what does God do? The land that these guys tried to take, God sends his people, people that have faith in their covenant with him, one of them's named Joshua, one of them named Caleb, okay? And then as you go down further, or, or you see that as Moses is going through there, they come across two of these guys, Sihon, right, of Heshbon, he's a king of the Amorites, and Og of, and there it is, Bashan, okay, because this is the area we're talking about, Bashan, where Mount Hermon is, um, and Bashan is this horrible place, which once again, in every culture throughout time, this particular area, today it is called Syria. Yeah, no, part, a part of Syria, it's not all of Syria, okay? This is where Bashan was. And every culture throughout its history, by the way, Mount Hermon is in there, that place was recognized by the Jews, by the Arabs, by the uh, Elamites, by the, you know, whatever ite you want to put in there, that area was recognized as a place you don't want to go because it belongs to the dead. It's a bad place, okay? That's, so again, we read these words, but we don't understand what's being said. They did. Make no mistake about it. But Moses is talking about in Deuteronomy chapter 2 and chapter 3, trying to encourage the new generation getting ready to go into the promised land under Joshua, Moses was reminding them, remember that God, through us, his people, defeated Sihon and Og. Og, by the way, in case you're wondering, is the guy whose bed was 13 and a half feet tall and almost seven feet wide. And I know people say, well, that's just metaphorical. No, it's not. Okay, it's not. Remember what they said? We look like grasshoppers to these guys, right? Well, people say, well, they were just tall people, you know, like nine feet. Okay, then why didn't you say we felt like a child to these guys? Or we felt like a dog? I mean, really? So, so you, I mean, the metaphor thing only goes so far. So whatever these guys were, they were abnormal and they were from the land of Bashan and it was a bad, bad place. Still a bad place. In fact, bad things are gonna come out of there. But that's where Mount Harmon is. What happened on Mount Harmon? Genesis 6 with the sons of God, the watchers and the daughters of men. It's all right there. Okay? So we defeated those, Moses is telling him. We see another one come down who was a descendant of Anak, right? There's an Anakim. And we know his name was Goliath. He was a descendant of Anak, who was a descendant of Arba, Right? So it just goes backwards. And again, how does God defeat these evil monstrosities that are abnormal? Goliath the giant. How does he defeat him? With a young boy with a sling. A little red-headed, freckle-faced dude plants a rock right between his forehead. You don't think God is mocking the enemy in this? Of course he is. Of course we know who this is. It's King David. So God uses his people always to overcome or to take back to take back to God what has been stolen by the enemy. And that's precisely what the church is supposed to do. What's the passage I always refer to? 
Jesus, standing at the foot of Mount Hermon, says, who do people say that I am? Well, you know, they say you're Jeremiah, you're Ezekiel, you're one of the prophets. Okay, but who do you say that I am? Remember this? See, now watch if this doesn't make a little more sense. Where's he standing? On this spot. But who do you say that I am? What does Peter say? You are Mashiach, the son, not of one of the gods, but of the living God, the true God. And what does Jesus say? That's exactly right, right? And I'm going to change your name from a little tiny pebble to a stone. And it's on that statement that I am the Messiah, the son of the living God, that I will build my what? My church. Oh, so the church is the modern day Joshua and Caleb. Have you ever thought and think about it like that? That's exactly who we are. What's the next statement? And I say to you, I, build, I will build my church and what? The gates of hell will not prevail, right? Why? Because of the church. Is it because of the church? Or but because of the, who the church represents, the Messiah, the son of the living God. What Jesus was doing that day at Mount Hermon when he made that statement standing there was to all of these guys and their spirits long dead and now in Sheol or in Hades. And he was telling to them, fellas, I'm here. It was mine and I'm taking it back. And I'm going to send my group of people, the church, and they're going to storm your gates and you cannot stop them. It was kind of a neener, 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 right? Now, another thing Peter tells us, or is it Paul? Uh, anyway, wherever in the New Testament, ah, I can't think of the reference, where Jesus, when he, when he, after he's crucified and he's in the tomb, where does he go? He goes to speak to the spirits in prison. Oh. Now, I taught, you have probably been taught, well, that's because, you know, we was called a prison because, you know, until Jesus made the way for, you know, for... Um, the believers to go into to the presence of God. And this, it's not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's not what was happening there. Because it's, well, it's all in the context of Noah, the flood. Hello? Connect the dots. What spirits were put in prison in the flood? The watchers. And all of those that followed them. So in essence, in the tomb, Jesus goes in there and he said, you thought you had it? You thought you could stop me? Well, guess what, fellas? Here I stand. And though I'm in the tomb right now, a couple of days from now, I'm breaking out of there. I win, you lose. You see, that's what's happening. How do we know? Because what did he do? And he led captivity, cap he led the captives away. He was the conqueror. Those are phrases that are only used of a defeated enemy, not of followers or believers. So that's why all of this stuff is so important. This is for us to understand. So now when you read these New Testament passages and you talk about Jesus and he's dealing with these people that are getting thrown into a fire and he's dealing with this guy that comes out of the tombs and he's, you know, and then Paul in the book of Acts is dealing with the woman says, you know, with the, when she's got the spirit. She's possessed by who? One of these, one of these, that's the spirits of these guys, one of, a demon, an evil spirit. We know who you are, Paul. We know who you preach, and every day we read there that Paul was telling, this is in Ephesus, right? So Acts chapter 19, uh, and Paul, actually it was earlier than that, but Paul is telling, you know, he's, he's dealing with, he's just ignoring it, and he's going on, finally he's had enough. He's had enough, and what does he do? He turns to the woman. It's not the woman he's turning to. It's the entity that's controlling her. And he says, shut up. And what happens? She's not able to speak. I'm not going to hear this anymore. So it wasn't just Jesus that dealt with this. It was Paul. It was Peter. It was all of those guys. Oh, but that just stopped. I thought that was supposed to have stopped with the gift of the Holy, I mean, with the, uh, with the church and with the age of grace. Well, these things all happened after that. So that doesn't work. So anyway, so throughout history, God's people have been in contact and have encountered this type of stuff. And it's still happening today. Again, we're oblivious to it because we live in mesquite. But it's happening everywhere. So 
Anyway, so uh, just a couple more things there. Well, darn it, I wanted to get to that last. Okay, so now let's look at this. So from the Nephilim and this bloodline that carried on, we start seeing these weird words in the scripture. And again, you guys know me. I'm, uh, you know how I am. I don't know why the translators, I don't care whether it's the King James translators, the NIV translators, I don't care who it is, right? Why didn't they just translate it the way that it says? I don't understand to change it. Because in one place, they'll use the word, uh, the, the words that we're going to look at. In the next place, they'll, 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 leave, they'll leave that, the, the he, very Hebrew word that they just got through telling us, and then they'll leave it out and, and put in what they think it means. And that has created problems. So here we go. So we read about these guys called the Repha. That's singular, Repha, okay? Plural, Rephaim. That's how you say that, okay? Who are they? Well, sometimes it's translated as giants, okay? Again, it isn't the size. It's something that's abnormal. But look at what it literally means, the dead. So the Repha are the dead. Well, who are the dead? You know, the demons and spirits of these guys and stuff. That's who they are. Okay, how do we know? Look at all of the passages. Okay, Job 26.5. Can anybody praise, can you be praised from the dead? It's not talking about people laying in the ground. It's talking about the spirits who have rejected him, which will never praise him. That's what's being described here. We could go on and on. Now, here's the one that's a key. Look at Isaiah chapter 14, verse 9. Does anybody know what this passage is? This is where we get Halel ben Shachar, right? How art thou fallen, O Halel ben Shachar? Lucifer. How are you fallen? Okay, well, that's verse 12. Well, what about, but it starts in verse 9. And there's, who is it that makes that statement? Is it the prophet Isaiah? No. Is it the people of Israel? No. Is it the king of Israel? No. Is it the king of Assyria who was the king at that particular time? No. Who is making the statement, how have you fallen, Halel ben Shachar, Lucifer? How is it that you have fallen? Do you know who it is in verse 9? The Repha. It's the dead that are telling him this. And the reason is, and now you're going to start to see where, where I've, this idea of the two types of evil, because we're talking about the Repha are from the sons of God, right? The Nephilim and on down that particular line. But who are they talking to? They're talking now to the one, the deceiver, the serpent, the dragon, the devil, whatever you want to call him, okay? They're talking to him. And notice what they say, and I don't have the passage here. You can look it up for yourself, but what they're saying to him in essence is, you thought you were never going to end up like us. Guess what? You're just like us. You're going to be here in the grave, separated from God, just like we are. You said, I'm going to lift myself up. I'm going to put my throne above the clouds. I'm going to reign as the most high. You who thought you were the most high, guess where you're going to end up? on a bed of worms, just like us. Do you see the two groups? He thinks he's beyond them. That's why they're making these statements. It's the Repha, the dead, that are calling out, are making these statements. Now, when you get to 2 Samuel, um, of all the passages in 2 Samuel, and then in 1 Chronicles and in Isaiah chapter 17, oh man, there's... More we could go up there, but we won't. Um, what you end up with is this is all about Goliath, the Philistine, where, where we know where it was, but what does the Bible call the place where they lived and where David slew Goliath and cut off his head, took his armor? What do they call it? It's the Valley of the Repha. Oh, so David is entered into a situation much like Joshua and Caleb back with Og and, and Sihon, the Amorite kings. You see? So there's this whole supernatural thing that's going on. But the connection is with God, Goliath. And this valley is called, you'll read, the Valley of the Giants. Right? Ho, 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 green giant. Right? So you see? But that, what's being described is this conflict between the people of God 
and the gods of the nations. That's what's being described here. We're going to look at that. We're not going to have time to get in it tonight. Okay. Well, that's just one group. Then another group that's named, and this is in, comes out of Genesis 14. These are the guys that Abraham went and got Lot back from. Okay, when Lot was with Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, and there's a there's a group of people that had been defeated. They were called the Zuzib. Okay. And what that mean, what that name means, and again, remember, these are not names, these are descriptions of particular groups of people. Okay. So the Zuzim were their that name means to devise, to plot, to purpose, or to think evil. So these people, remember Genesis? They only thought evil continually. Okay? So that's the idea here. And then there's the Emim. The Emim, they what that means, if you said, oh no, they're Emim. You were saying they're dreadful, they're fearful, they're horrible, they're terrible, or they're terrifying. They're terrors. So these are not normal people. Okay? These aren't eight foot, you know, shack sized individuals that were called giants. These people are ab, whatever they are, is abnormal. And there was great fear of them. But Abraham says, I don't care. They have my nephew Lot. I'm going to get him back. He knows all of this stuff. So he goes and, and there's a guy that's introduced here whose name is um, Amraphel. We're going to get to that next because notice that Abraham defeats him. And by the way, it's Amraphel and the kings that are with him that have defeated the Zuzim and the Amim. Okay? So there's a fight between whoever this Amraphel is and the Zuzim. They, Amraphel has conquered them. Okay? And now, because that's where Sodom and Gomorrah was, and now he has Lot, and Abraham goes and gets him back. That's all in Genesis chapter 14. You see the conflict here? It wasn't against Abraham and the four kings or the five kings that we find in Genesis chapter 14. It was the covenant people of God going against those who would attempt to destroy the covenant, which is the same group that tried to destroy or, or change the, the genetics of man to stop uh, the seed of the woman. But notice that Amraphel defeats, because he, we're going to see he represents somebody else, Nimrod, okay? So Nimrod, he defeats the people that are connected with the Nephilim. Remember what I said? There's a conflict in the supernatural realm, in the realms of evil. One side is what we would call Lucifer and the fallen angels, and the other is the demons and the evil spirits, which are descendants of the Nephilim, therefore the sons of God and the daughters of men. And they're in conflict with one another, but they have a common enemy. His name is Messiah, or its title is Messiah. His name is Yeshua, okay? That's what's going on here. Now, in Genesis chapter 14, Abraham goes after they've destroyed the, the remnants of the, the sons of God, these five kings, this Amraphel and the guys that are with him, then Abraham goes and destroys them, okay? I'm going to show you that I believe that Amraphel is Nimrod. And this is the demise of Nimrod. There was the Tower of Babel, which brought him down around, and then Abraham defeats him in Genesis chapter 14. But where is all of this taking place? Well, look at the map. Look at all the names, the Rephaim, the Zuzim, the Emim, the Horites. That's another group that are not mentioned in this particular area. And of course, the Amorites and the Valley of Sidim. That's the salt, so in other words, around the Dead Sea. Notice where all of that is taking place in his day. What's going on right there, right now? What is that place called today? And it, by the way, it's never been at rest. This is where the uh, the Palestinians are at, folks. We call that place the West Bank or Gaza. Oops, I'm sorry, Gaza's down here. The West Bank. So again, you thought it was a Palestinian-Israeli thing. Oh no, it's much older than that. This is a conflict within the supernatural realm with the direct effect within the physical realm. It's called the West Bank, okay? It's just, it's just incredible when you, uh, when you start to understand this. And by the way, let me see if I can go back. Well, it's hard to see, at least on mine, maybe on the screen up here, it's, it's easier, I don't know. But you see, you see the Dead Sea there? You see Hebron? 
You see that there's sort of an X there, like at the Dead Sea, see right above that, that's Hebron. Notice the name underneath of it. Kiriath Arba, where Caleb said, I want this land and I'm going to kick them out. I'm going to run them out. In Jesus's time, this was called Samaria. It's the land of Judea and Samaria. So again, what you think you're watching on TV is a new development isn't new at all. It was happening. This is the days of Abraham, okay? This is 400 years prior to the Jews returning from, from Egypt down in the south and coming up into the promised land. So this, this, is, this is pre-Israel. This is Abraham, okay? It, there, you know, there, there isn't even a Jacob and an Isaac in the 12 tribes yet. So you see, this is older than the Jews. That's why we know from Scripture it's not a Jew, Gentile, or Jew, Palestinian, or Arab, or anybody else conflict. It predates all of that by millennia. But you're convinced because people like in my position will teach you that this is a new thing and it's a problem because of the Palestinian plight and a defiance of the borders of the 1967 war. It's the, the absurdity of that is beyond comprehension. And yet, this is what we're told. It's sad. This goes way back before this. This is a fight over the land of the Messiah, which is what our study in Daniel on Sundays is telling us all about. It's about, Daniel's book is about Messiah and what? The nations. So, so one more slide, and we'll just, we'll just take a look at this and then see. So what we've seen now is the flood. We've seen the sons of God, the Nephilim. We saw their judgment, the sons of God to the abyss, right? But that's where they are. They're going to get out for a short part of time, and then they're judged. They die physically, and they become the evil spirits. Okay, that's the first thing on our line. Now, next time, what we're going to look at is Genesis chapter 10. We're going to see the rebellion now of a different sort of evil, and this is, of course, Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. And I believe he's the next in line from the seed of the serpent, which is entirely different than the seed of the sons of God and the watch, or the watchers and the women, uh, the daughters of men. So it's really interesting. But this is all you can, uh, hopefully, and I know it's hard for you guys because it's hard in this period of time to try to communicate all this. And I know I talk fast and I know showing all the charts and all that stuff, I get it. That's why we put them online. But, but you know, we, we just, we have to keep moving. We just, we can't just, you know, so it, it's just, I know it's a lot of information. I get it. But that's why it's online and you can get the notes, the PDF and all that. Or at least I'm told uh, that you can do that. I haven't tried it myself. But you can go on there so you can sort of go back and, and look and understand this stuff. But now, one last thing. This is what, this is the perspective that Dr. Heiser has been teaching. Okay? And it's, it's growing I mean, I mean, this stuff, because it's, a, it's, a, it's time to start looking at the scripture with, with fresh eyes, which is exactly what Daniel, Gabriel told Daniel would happen in the last days. Knowledge will increase. Well, it's time for us to wise up. And all of the dumb hindrances that we put on the word of God and, the, and the, how we keep the spirit of God in check, because we don't want to deal with the supernatural aspect. And we don't like the idea of law. We much prefer the law, the idea of grace and all of this stuff when we see that they're one and the same, okay? So it's just, it's, it's just crazy, but that's what we have done. And that's why there's the confusion that there is. So hopefully as we move through this, you could see this is all about, it's not about Caleb. It's not about Joshua. It's not about Moses or the Jews. It's not about Abraham. It's not about the defend, descendants of the Nephilim. It is all about one person. His name is Jesus. Because he, and he alone, is the spirit of prophecy. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, thanks for this evening. Lots of stuff. I know, Lord, I, 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 you know, it's, it's got to be tough to try to grasp all of this. But the, the key thing to understand is that the conflict, once again, that we are in is not, not totally focused in the physical. There's a supernatural element to this, has always been and will always be until you return and set it all straight. Lord, how we long for those days. But we thank you for your word, as difficult and challenging as it may be, because it is truth. And if we'll embrace it as that, the world as we understand it today will make a lot more sense. Why is the world in the condition it's in? 
It's because of the stuff we've been talking about. So thank you for being here with us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, God bless you guys.